I'm talking about the um, symmetry of the chest we want to make look at uh, right versus left right uh, we want to make sure that we have good equal bilateral chest rise right we don't want to see any unilateral stuff just the right going up or just the left going up okay um, we definitely want to look for trauma such as things like flail chest remember that flail chest is um, that flail chest is uh, multiple ribs two or more ribs broken in two or more places on the same side okay <coughs> excuse me so if I'm talking about my right thoracic cage my right side of my rib cage that would be two or more ribs broken in two or more places and it caused a paradoxical reaction all right so that little piece of chest that's actually broken off from my chest wall right because there's two or more ribs broken in two or more places um, when I breathe in it actually sunks down right you will actually see that little piece of chest actually suck down and when I breathe out it'll actually push up remember the best way to treat that is just put a bag of saline on it and kind of wrap the chest to try to help equalize the pressure okay um, always make sure that you guys are also uh, listening for lung sounds especially on the area if there is a flail chest or if you guys do see um, unequal chest rise or unilateral chest rise make sure that we're looking listening for lung sounds right away to see if uh, we possibly have a uh, pneumothorax going on there's a link to a, a, a video for the flail chest uh, I have also included this video uh, in your module for you guys to watch this week. Accessory muscle use, any super, uh, uh, super clav clavicle muscle use right above the clavicles, any neck muscles that we see, are they sunken in at the clavicles, are they really working on breathing, uh, really trying to use every single muscle in their body in order to get that good chest expansion. Their intercostals, are they using their intercostals, can we see them being sunk, are they really kind of exaggerating on how much they're actually trying to uh, expand their chest and then are they um, using their abdominal muscles are they belly breathing in order to help to get that chest expansion as well so when we're talking about uh, breath sounds um, these are going to become very important at the paramedic level and it's going to become very important as far as your testing and how you guys are going to be treating your patients and uh, for National Registry as well, they are so important that I have created a whole uh, audio library for you guys to actually start listening to under your uh, breath sounds module. All that is, guys, is a whole bunch of audio recordings for you guys to start listening to what actual breath sounds sound like, okay? Um, and if you guys can even Google and find more than those, I would listen to those as well, okay? Um, but it is very important that we are going to start really truly practicing our lung sounds, making sure that we can truly determine between wheezing and ronchi and fine and coarse, crail, uh, fine and coarse rails, right, um, and other, and strider and stuff like that, okay? Please make sure that you guys go onto your uh, Blackboard shell and listen to that module with the breath sounds, and you guys are going to have to do it. Uh, more than once you guys need to get these down okay um, so when we talk about the different kinds of vocabulary that we're going to associate with our uh, lung sounds when we're talking about eupnea uh, eupnea is actually normal breathing compared to tachypnea or bradypnea or apnea stuff like that okay tracheal sounds are best heard over the tracheal when we're actually going to auscultate for those sounds um, when we're talking about the, the actual bronchi, we can actually hear the bronchi. They're right in between the second and third intercostal space. Uh, and it's actually easier to hear during the expiratory phase than it is for the inhalation phase. All right, and I got um, slides coming up to show you where to put placement on your stethoscope for all these. Um, and I'll also include those um, specific pictures in your, um, in your uh, uh, module that uh, I've created for you guys. Um, when we're talking about the bronchovesicular, those are uh, heard over the posterior side. Um, pretty much the same, same place, the second and third intercostal space on the posterior. And then the vesicular is uh, kind of present throughout all lung fields um, from the alveolar uh, lung movement, okay? And again, um, I'll have slides coming up showing you what this actually looks like. Here, um, the sounds that we are going to hear are any adventitious lung sounds anything outside the normal okay in fact when you approach your patient if they're healthy 
and they're tracking you, um, you shouldn't hear lung sounds at all, right? Uh, if you guys can hear audible lung sounds, even without putting on your stethoscope, we need to definitely push up the priority of that patient and really kind of start thinking if we need to get more aggressive right off the bat with our airway breathing from our A's and B's um, as soon as we make patient contact, right? Uh, but remember that Strider, when we're talking about Strider, nothing's changed with Strider from basic, guys. Strider is still your only upper airway uh, lung sound that you guys are going to hear. And remember, that is extreme swelling or possible closure of the upper airway. So this is, you guys can hear this for a uh, foreign body obstruction. You guys can hear this with some kind of anaphylaxis or, or some kind of allergic reaction. Um, we can hear this... Um, uh, for, uh, again, like I said, a, like a foreign body obstruction for like little kiddos specifically, epiglottitis. If the epiglottitis is really bad, we can actually hear the strata from that as well. Uh, absent lung sounds are bad, right? Um, we want to make sure that uh, if there are absent lung sounds, uh, that uh, looking at our patient and kind of getting a good history to find out why. Uh, specifically, like we're talking about absent lung sounds when it comes to uh, either trauma. Do we have bilateral pneumos, right? Do we need to dart both sides of the chest? Do we need to bar dart uh, just one side of the chest um, where we can't hear the sounds? Or if we're talking about medical, are these actually silent lung sounds and not necessarily absent, right? If we're dealing with that allergic reaction or a severe asthma attack, we can get that silent chest. That's basically where more than half of the actual lobes of the lungs are not getting air movement because the uh, bronchi are starting to swell. Okay, um, so we will hear uh, like extreme wheezing possibly in the upper airways, but when it comes to the lower airways, we're not hearing any air movement whatsoever. Right? Uh, this is usually the first sign of the administration of epinephrine. Giving them a shot of epinephrine, 0 0.3 milligrams, boom, right off the bat intramuscular and then reassessing our um, vital uh, reassessing our lung sounds while we are starting our uh, duoneb right our buterol and ipratropium mix um, and kind of getting that on board um, while we're reassessing the lung sounds and remember when we have those silent lung sounds and we have that extreme wheezing in the upper we don't hear any lung sounds in the lower and we have administered the epinephrine we should start hearing extreme wheezing throughout Okay, we should start hearing wheezing where the lungs were silent before. That way we know that the actual um, epinephrine has, has worked. And you guys can do that, do multiple rounds of epinephrine, right, if you guys need to you know, in that situation. Um, when we talk about wheezing, wheezing is, um, um, there's kind of different levels of wheezing, right? We have that extreme level of wheezing where we actually have, like I just talked about with the epinephrine, extreme upper wheezing and silent lungs, right? And then we have wheezing throughout on um, both inhalation and exhalation, okay? Um, inspiratory wheezing is actually worse than expiratory wheezing. That means that that swelling is really severe. Um, it's kind of moving kind of a little bit further up in the upper airway than we need to. Um, expiratory wheezing, usually when you guys are starting to just hear expiratory wheezing, whatever your guys' treatment that you guys are doing, is truly working and if we are just hearing expiratory wheezing in our patients and we haven't produced any kind of pharmacolog uh, pharmacological uh, measures or anything like that usually it takes just a little bit of some albuterol or epitropium in order to kind of clear that up okay um, and then also remember um, uh, the use of CPAP can really help us out in all this as well to kind of really force that medication down as far as we can get it for our patients and Make sure you're actually coaching your patients too. Make sure that you're, you're, you're telling them, you're explaining to them, you're showing them, you're getting in their face, you're looking to eye to eye, and you're actually showing them how to breathe in order to try to get that medication all the way down into those lower lobes um, to help out, right? Um, you guys are now dealing with uh, corticosteroids, okay? Let's get some Dex, let's get some Solumedrol on board, all right? Um, and then if we really need to, if nothing else is working, um, let's go ahead and, and uh, maybe start a mag drip so we can get that really 
smooth muscle relaxation um, around our bronchial tree in order to help us uh, with the inflammation going on in our upper airway. Uh, so when we ask which is worse um, for uh, wheezing, uh, the worst is when both, uh, when you hear extreme wheezing, both expiratory and inspiratory. Inspiratory is worse than expiratory, okay, when you guys hear wearing that. Uh, ronchi. Ronchi uh, is like that gurgling or bubbling sound, kind of like we explained it to you guys, is actually like filling up a glass with water and sticking a straw in it and blowing air through the straw into the water. You guys will hear that kind of bubbling or gurgling. Okay. Uh, crackles. Crackles are tough. Okay. Crackles are very tough to distinguish, guys. Um, it really sounds like um, a couple of uh, pieces of hair. Right, being kind of rolled in your fingers together. It's it's it could be that it could be that faint, right? Um, but usually we get the uh, the crackles can be anywhere. Okay, it's not necessarily going to be focused in the lowers. We're not necessarily focused in the uppers. We can get crackles uh, throughout. We'll talk about crackles more when we get to the disease processes, or they could sound distant, and we'll talk about distant a little bit more as well um, in the disease process. Maybe it's because of fluid. Right? Maybe we're actually maybe the lung is so filled up that we're actually listening to the actual uh, air movement through the fluid of the lungs. Okay, um, and remember, just a um, another thing when we're talking about absence lung sounds, uh, we want to get a history of our patient. Right? Uh, have they had a lobectomy? Do they have a history of like lung cancer and they actually had part of their lung removed or something like that? Okay. Always think about pneumothorax and always think about bronchospasms. Okay. When you guys are talking about those distant lung sounds, uh, really the disease process that comes to mind for me is emphysema, right? Uh, it's just going to, like, you can hear air movement, but it sounds like it's really, really kind of far away. And that's really because they don't have the elasticity or the bounce anymore in their lungs um, in order to get that nice, full, deep chest expansion. I hope this is a review for you guys. I really do, right? Um, stethoscope use. Uh, look at the pictures for a good review. Okay, so hopefully that last uh, slide was definitely a review with you guys for the uh, stethoscope placement. Make sure that your ears are uh, pointing forward. Um, <clears throat> it's okay in the heat of the moment if they point backwards. Just make sure that you guys catch yourself because if not, I'm going to make fun of you. Um, <clears throat> breast sounds, okay, these are kind of like the points of where we're looking at. Uh, we do want to do front and back in six different places along with the actual flanks, okay? Um, we want open mouth. We want them breathing through their mouth, inhaling and exhaling without actually trying to grunt or making any other noise if possible, all right? To make sure that you guys are comparing one side to the other. You guys don't go all the way down the right side and then move to the left or vice versa. You want to go from right to left, 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 from right to left okay? like the front we want to compare left to right on the back as well this gives you a good um, kind of visual of where you guys will be practicing your lung sounds um, and getting your lung sounds from your patients this is including the mannequins when you guys get back in class to actually uh, start playing with the mannequins all right uh, same thing compare one side to the other don't go straight down to the left don't go straight down to the right we want to compare one side to the other okay that's the way we're going to get the best assessment of our lung sounds is comparing right to left all right a visual representation of the actual uh, lungs and how they look on a ch on the uh, drawn on the chest right and those are kind of where they are underlying uh, the actual lung tissue underlies underneath your chest cavity so you guys can get a visual of that a good look at um, how the lungs are actually kind of lung tissue is kind of spread um, posteriorly so that you guys can actually see uh, where you guys should actually be putting your stethoscope so compare these to the actual ones where I'm putting the actual numbers on the back of the chest making sure that you guys are kind of avoiding the, uh, the scapula right the shoulder blade back there uh, you don't want to put your stethoscope on that bone because you're not going to hear anything right but definitely not very least, uh, this is what the lung looks like on the actual flanks on both the right and left side, just to give you guys a visual and what they look like underneath the skin. And here is actually going to go into the lung sounds themselves to kind of give you guys brief descriptions um, of what is actually going on. All right. Uh, so when we're talking about strider, we already know that it's an upper airway sound. It's our only upper airway sound that we'll actually hear if something is occluding the airway. 
Uh, it can transmit into the chest and make it very hard um, for you guys to hear the rest of the lung and or um, it might even appear as wheezing. <clears throat> I want you guys to get into the habit now, specifically at the paramedic level, that if you guys hear wheezing in the upper lobes of the chest, that you guys are now starting to put your stethoscope onto the trachea and listening there, okay? Because um, you could possibly hear the strider or um, in the in the trachea, right? If we do have upper upper wheezing in the uh, in the lobes or wheezing in the upper lobes, but if we don't hear strider in the trachea, then we know it's just a wheeze, um, and we can kind of work with that a little easier than if we actually had strider. Okay. What causes this? Okay. Um, and how would you rule this sound out? All right. Those are things I want you to kind of think about. Um, this could be a airway obstruction. Uh, the number one um, culprit of Strider is something in the airway, specifically with our kiddos. Okay, yeah, we can hear it in adults because there are some really freaky adults out there that like to put some really weird stuff in their mouth. Okay, um, that can get lodged and cause an upper airway ob obstruction or you know, us adults, specifically us in EMS, trying to eat our food within five seconds, not even taking a breath, right? We might swallow wrong and we start to choke and, um, you know, that could uh, develop the strider if it's partially occluded, okay? Uh, how do we roll this sound out? Well, you need to put your stethoscope onto the trachea and be looking into the airway while you're doing this to see if you can see something actually occluding the airway. Absent sounds, a um, couple things I want you guys to kind of keep in mind for this, all right? Uh, absent sounds could be an accumulation of pus buildup, right, due to a uh, maybe a pneumonia or possibly um, some other kind of uh, infection due to left-sided congestive heart failure or whatnot, all right? Um, and remember that we're now going into kind of paramedic land and we're looking for that um, differential diagnosis sometimes between like a pneumonia and the left side of congestive heart failure and for those of you guys that already know it really it is a history right the history of the patient um, if you guys do a good medical history and the fact that fever right um, we can pretty much rule out a lot of respiratory stuff if the patient's complaining of shortness of breath with a productive cough they got junky lung sounds and they got a fever that just screams pneumonia to me okay <clears throat> But again, we're moving up into paramedic land. Um, pneumonia, uh, it is rare, but you guys can have bilateral pneumonias. Okay, you can have pneumonias in both right and left lungs, right? Back in basic land, we were kind of just keeping it to one lung. But now you guys can have um, pneumonias in both, uh, in both lungs, so keep that in mind. Uh, it could be air, all right? It can be air. It could be a collapsed lung, okay? And there is a differential, uh, I'm sorry, a a difference between actual air and blood. Um, some people use um, the, uh, the the tympanic method or a thudding method to kind of um, actually differentiate the two. Um, it's kind of a hard process to explain. I'll see if I can find a, a video for you guys. But really, if we're dealing with the air, let's say I have um, popped my right lung, okay? And you guys hear absent lung sounds on my right, but I have good lung sounds on my left. Maybe some JVD is showing because of the actual increase in the inner thoracic pressure, whatever. Either way, you guys are expecting that uh, I might have um, collapsed my lung. You can actually uh, take the head of your stethoscope, and if you hit it, right, just sideways, right, don't hit it on a thing and make sure it's not in your ears while you do it, right? But if you hit it on the side of the chest, it would sound uh, more of a thump than a thud okay if it's a thump if it's that kind of sounds like a drum right that's air that's air in the chest if it's a thud like a thunk right um it's it's usually blood and it's it's a, a trick of the trade i guess is the best way to put it um and i'll see if i can find a video for you guys on that but it could be air it could be fluid right if we have some kind of fluid accumulation we're thinking maybe a hemothorax we got blood in the chest or a possible pleural effusion kind of focus on the term agophony for you guys. Agophony is actually um, a technique that we use to um, auscultate the lungs. If we have a lot of lung 
consolidation fluid in the lungs or possibly uh, some kind of uh, fibrosis of the lungs or something, we can use a technique that's known as agophony. And basically what you guys do is you have the per, uh, patient say uh, a long English E. So just E, right? While the patient's doing that, you guys are listening to their lungs. Um, if there's actual fluid in the lungs, okay, that resonance will actually sound like the letter A in their lungs. So they'll be going E and you hear the uh okay or a right <clears throat> something like that it's just another tool that we could use uh, to help determine um, if there is uh, fluid in the lungs and I do have a video in this module for you guys to watch we're talking about um, bronchoconstriction of the actual bronchioles okay the actual parts that are actually down deep into the lungs this is a lower airway uh, air, airway sound and lower lower airway breath sound so if it's an irritant or an allergy or whatnot, whatever is causing the actual swelling or the irritation of the actual uh, bronchioles, we're also getting fluid and mucus kind of build up in those areas, which is actually also starting to close the airway even more. Okay, so we have to combat that, and you guys can do that pharmaceutical. I'm not going to go over that with you guys. Again, you guys can check that out um, in your pharmacology or whatnot or in your actual uh, respiratory treatment guidelines. Um, however, just remember that not all wheezing is asthma, okay? We can have cardiac wheezes. You guys will cover this a little bit in your cardiac class. I want you guys to remember this. I'm going to make it really simple for you guys. When we're talking about cardiac wheezing, these are wheezes that are positional, kind of moving wheezes, okay? So let's say you guys respond to that scene. You got your, your uh, patient that is laying flat. You guys decide to check lung sounds while they're laying flat, and you guys hear wheezing in the lower lobes, right? You guys sit her up or stand them up or whatever, um, and now the wheezing is in the upper lobes, right? The, that wheeze is kind of um, wheezing, um, or moving, I guess I should say. Um, but this is also based on patient history, okay? And probably the story of what's going on with the patient in the first place is all going to kind of point you towards those cardiac wheezings or that cardiac asthma. And again, you guys will get uh, a little bit more of this when it comes to um, cardiac class. Um, those are definitely um, wheezes that you want to really kind of think twice about. Maybe try to do something else before you start taking the actual wheeze with some kind of albuterol or um, ipotropium mix, right? Because if we do have cardiac wheezes, that does really kind of mean that the cardi that the uh, the the heart muscle is is uh, becoming damaged. That there's something else going on um, that we probably need to address first before we start tackling those wheezes. When we're talking about inspiratory, expiratory, both, I've already talked about this. Which one do you guys uh, consider is worse, inspiratory, expiratory, um, or both?